Catholic, ladies and gentlemen, when society breaks the law, and this is a threat to our liberty between what is and what should be, it's not just something we'll be talking about today. We also discussed this yesterday in a small group, and this was made possible by Dr. Flick. This is puzzling, this topic. It's not just a question of solving the problems at hand, but we have to think about what this means, societies that break their own law. Isn't this a contradiction in terms? Society, don't they define what law is? Law is the rules, not just the requirements and regulations, but it's something that is done on a regular basis, how you act. And breaking the law is the exception to the rule. It's an individual going against the collective group. So it seems to me that when society breaks their own laws, this is a, something that doesn't even exist. When we, we talk about law being defined as the general view as being what is correct, but this is goes back since the days of Rousseau, and this is the general consensus which defines what is law, or John Rawls, the U.S. philosopher, who says the right law is something that the members of society can agree on when it comes to the future. This also means a different way of understanding this. So the difference between what is and what should be is we talk about law as an institution. If we have a constitution and then we have democratically legitimized institutions, then there will be possibilities for everything as to what should be. And if we take these legal requirements and also the constitutional law as law itself, and then if you come into a conflict here, you will see that there might be different public opinions, there might be collectives within the overall collective that need to not be able to agree on this. So this is something that can be defined as a conflict between the law as a product of constitutionalized and legitimized institutions and the vague open discussions in society. Now the second puzzle in this is in the phrase that says, a threat to our freedom. What is our freedom? Who are we? And that is the collective that we're talking about. Maybe we're a smaller collective or group when we talk about people breaking the laws. Well, society is defined by state, but homogeneity is being lost more and more when it comes to our state. There are a few things where a society is in Germany or in Austria can really agree on. Questions of migration also mean that the collective within a society would have the basic, I can no longer come up with a basic understanding of these rules. So that's why I think it's important for us to determine what we mean by we. Maybe it needs to be redefined or we need to determine what it means. Abraham Lincoln said that it, we are a nation built upon principles, a nation of people who stand up for our Constitution to pick up by Dolph Steinbecker. So it seems quite elegant when we take a look at the definition of our topic today, the word freedom or liberty. A lot of the laws that are broken seems to be focused on something which is abstract, the state, the power of the monopolies, whatever. As Ms. Flick just said in her introduction today, all of this transitions into interventions in individuals and their position. So it's not just a small group versus the large group. It's also breaking the law by which will have something to do and a negative impact on each individual or the rule of law. And I can say for us, in our working group, 
our job was to take this relatively broad topic and to break it down into individual case groups. I'd like to give you some different situations where what is and what should be, and we talk about consensus, and maybe we can come up with some ideas to try to solve the situation. There are cases, for example, where developments in state and society happen first. And if you take a look at criminal law in the 1950s and the laws on homosexuality, I think it will be clear to you right away, away that these are areas where social consensus has changed over the decades. And then something that was abolished in the 1970s is something that was law that was no longer enforced. It was no longer accepted by society. Such cases will exist at all times so that society will be able to experiment. Friedrich von Heine said that this is where morals come into play, that the mass population abides by the law, but individuals can experiment around with things. But laws shouldn't be that way. It became clear, and Ingo Paris mentioned this. He said that there's also a type of disobedience, and this shows us different processes, which are also a type of process, not resistance vis-a-vis -vis society, but an attempt to make progress in society. The sit-ins in the 1970s, or today, maybe some of the protests against the transport of nuclear waste. These are breaking the law, but it is a separate case which has a lot of impact on the public, and this is also something that might need to be dealt with separately. Both of these cases are cases where we can see that society is moving to change the laws, but we have the opposite situ situation as well. Sometimes the state can create laws so that moral and societal standards can be established. My colleague Christoph Engel talks about this at the Max Planck Institute. He says that the state is and someone who's bringing us up, so to speak. Take environmental protection in society in the 1970s. This was really not very much accepted, but legislation made progress here. And if you take a look at the catalytic converters in our cars, how we had tax rebates, etc., to allow us to establish a standard, and now everyone is willing to accept these catalytic converters, even though there is no incentive. The antitrust law in the 1950s was another exa example. There was a you, there was a business scene in the U.S. which saw the U.S. where there are all sorts of antitrust laws. There was a lot of resistance there. The capital market is familiar with the ban on insider trainings. This was a minor offense just 20 years ago, but this is very strictly enforced these days, and it's accepted. The state is therefore ahead of society in this area. But there are more complicated cases as well. New technologies, new challenges, young people confront the question as to what is right and what is not, they might meet this for the first time when they download music, which is illegal. Music from Azerbaijan, they can get the newest songs. There is a clear response to all of these. are all violations of copyright law. But the consensus on this has not yet been developed on this question. There is still no technical control. But is this just breaking the law? And can we sanction it? Is this being impeded? Or will we be coming up with new consensus in society? The Pirates Party has tried to make us clear to us. This is a question of civil disobedience, they say, not just a, quest a question of using something without paying for it. But it might be the beginning of something new, being more open to information 
which is something that we're familiar with in scientific areas. Then there are cases where there have always been laws, but there has not been any enforcement of these laws. Dr. Flick, you mentioned that yourself. Take, for example, the field of taxes 30 years ago, not only seen as a minor offense, but this is something that the state didn't really enforce. There was consensus that was never really mentioned, but they say, if you don't declare it, we won't do anything. And it was the Constitutional Court, and Mr. Korfoff was responsible for that decision. And we have to also have equality when it comes to enforcement. And this was then the beginning of the developments that continue to this day. At the same time, with the developments towards state access, we can also see different views when it comes to this offense. The major problem that we see here is the problem of transformation. Today, we're in a situation where acting illegally and states that act illegally, and these are then, this is probably the worst of all possible solutions. If you're in such a situation, you have to talk about agreements or amnesty, such as the case with Switzerland, and this should put an end to all of this. So these are all cases where the behavior by society is not always something that has been agreed on, but it means that many people are involved in this, and this is something that deviates from the state's claim. And I think this has to be distinguished here, and I think Mr. Stark gave us the example of the European fiscal crisis, and we talk about the collective action by the states. This is not the only crisis we have. We also talked about collective intervention of Western military forces in Kosovo and Iraq without sufficient basis or a decision by the Security Council of the United Nations. This is also collective action which should be looked into. Are there any solutions? Well, law would say, first of all, that the law needs to be enforced. In other words, full enforcement of the law. But then a state can say, okay, this could also be a risk to our freedom and a police state. Remember 10 years ago when Hans Eichel, the Minister of Finance in Germany, said that the social authorities and the tax offices would go to the private households in order to see who was hired there by the private individuals. This was not carried out because there was no social consensus with this type of involvement in the private sphere. So this, should the state become a state of incentives? Should they try to use soft and positive incentives to make people abide by the laws? Let's take the example of people working in individual homes. Tax laws decided that you could use part of this as a tax deduction in order to get costs. This was an incentive to make people obey, abide by the laws. This might be more effective than the police solution. Then there could be situations where the market makes solutions available. I have young daughters, and I'm glad that it is now a question of legal downloads, and in this way, I don't have any other alternatives. So if the problem is with enforcement, then the question has to ask the question about which legally binding requirements are so absolutely necessary that they must be enforced. This was an interim result of our working group. Too many laws too detailed rules and regulations. Of course, we have to have rules and regulations, labor law, technical questions. We want our roads and the laws of the road to be clear enough. And when our cars are passed, when they pass expensive, yes. But this should not become too, too much. Many of you are familiar with the requirements by corporate governance in the codes of corporate governments and governance. Now, I wonder if all this is something that's going to contribute to economic success. I really don't know. Many of you are entrepreneurs. I'm not, but one thing I do know is that a law 
it's not one law is one thing is that not anybody who everybody knows the rules of the game is always the one who wins so the state has to think about how far they need to go the state also has to think about to what extent they might have some unrealistic requirements the stability right criteria from the Maastricht treaty or the legal claim to daycare for small children the state must not pass laws which cannot be enforced the state must remain credible and the state must remain what economists call time consistent and one thing must not happen and Joseph Isensei warned about this I went to his seminar as a student and that is an economic crisis which must never become a crisis of our Constitution economic crises financial crises must not become legal crises otherwise we will see that there's something wrong in the setup of our legal system. We have to reduce things to what is absolutely necessary. And that is why we have to make sure that the rules and regulations and the stabilizing effect that they have, that's why we must not call into question the essential laws and that we really also see the question of many minor aspects. So this could also mean, and there'll be a meeting on this in Munich in September, and that will be the introduction of new democratic processes, more participation by the citizens. Mr. Huber is one of those who says that in order to reduce the difference between the laws and the citizens, we will need a new form of participation. Stuttgart 21, that's a citizens action group where the citizens were talking about an underground railway station calling the safety of nuclear power into question. Well, this is something that you hear and again and again. You see a loss and solidarity and morals. But there are other examples as well in environmental areas, in transparency, in corruption. What about morals and attitudes and behavior? Has the situation changed? Sometimes due to laws and sometimes as a result of society. But I'd like to come back to one question here. Who are we? Solidarity with our legal system. That means how large can a group be? Can how large can a group be to ensure this type of stability? Economists talk about the optimum club size. These cannot be small states like we had in the past. Ms. Flick talked about the constitutional state in the Federal Republic of Germany. Is Europe stable enough today to be a benchmark for legal solidarity? Or are there other things to think about climate change where we talk about worldwide legal aspects here there are certain doubts but the size of the problem the magnitude of this problem requires major answers this won't help us however if in individual cases the law and consensus in society do not converge now, we have to talk about here necessities, and there are no bans when there are necessities. And our chancellor talked about the lack of alternatives for certain measures. Now, we don't have an answer to these questions yet. So maybe you can help us find some answers. But we did find out, and Dr. Hirchhoff said, that there's an ongoing attempt to come to the best legal situation. That is what has to be our leading principle. Maybe we can change enforcement, or maybe in certain very important systems, we, situations, we can change the situation. What's important here is that we have to have constancy, and that is to say we have to always want to let everyone consider what they need. And what you have now and what you have deserved is the coffee break.